Discover Geography, Lesson 2-1, Introduction to Maps. When we think about maps, we often imagine that a map is just like a picture of the Earth. So here's a picture of the Earth. This is a picture specifically of the city of Pittsburgh, taken from space. But this isn't really a very helpful picture. We can make some guesses about what's going on here. We can look at that picture and say, well, that looks like a river. That looks like a road there. But it isn't really a very good map if you just have a picture. Here, on the other hand, is a much more useful map. This is a map that shows us specifically where the roads are going. It labels a bunch of them according to what the name of the road is. It shows a difference between the highways and the major streets and the minor streets. And it even has a little border there to show the edges of the city of Pittsburgh itself. So a map is a simplified representation of the Earth's surface for a specific purpose. So it takes everything that's going on on the Earth's surface and it selects certain aspects of that that we're going to show on the map and it throws away everything else. So a map is going to simplify, it's going to focus on certain things in order to highlight them, and it's going to ignore other things. And it's going to do that based on what the purpose of the map is. Every map has a purpose or a goal. And that goal is going to tell you what kind of choices you should make in creating that map. So we can map the same place in a variety of different ways depending on what our goal is. And you see here a whole bunch of different maps that have been made of the city of Pittsburgh. All equally valid maps just serving different purposes and therefore showing different information, different aspects of the Earth's surface. So maps involve making choices. And you have to think about what the purpose of the map is in order to know what choices you should be making. So one of the key choices is what to include, what information is going to go on your map. So here's an example of a map of the United States showing the crude death rate, that's the number of deaths per 100,000 people per year for each state. So that's one thing that we might want to map. Here's another map that shows what's called the age-adjusted mortality rate. This is also a rate per 100,000 people. It's a, a rate of deaths. But in this case, we've adjusted the numbers to account for the fact that old people are more likely to die than younger people. So if you have a state with a lot of old people in the population and not so many young people, of course there's going to be more deaths in that state than another state that has mostly younger people and very few older people. So if we adjust for the differences in the age structure of the population, we get a somewhat different looking map. So which is the best map? If we put them side by side, we can definitely see it matters which we select. If you look at the state of Pennsylvania, it has one of the higher crude death rates in the country, but is kind of in the middle on the age-adjusted mortality rate. The state of Texas has one of the lowest crude death rates in the country, but it has somewhere in the middle on the age-adjusted mortality rate. So we see a very different pattern here. Well, it depends on what the purpose of the map is. If you're drawing this map because you want to use the death rate as an indicator of the quality of the health of the people in a particular state, you're going to want to map the age-adjusted mortality rate. You're not going to want to penalize a state for having a lot of old people if those old people are no more likely to die than old people in another state. On the other hand, if you're using this map to decide where to build a funeral home, well, all that matters there is how many people are dying. That's how many customers you're going to have. It doesn't matter if they're dying because your state has a lot of old people in it or your state has a lot of unhealthy young people in it or whatever other reason. So either of those maps is a useful map. It just depends on what you're going to use it for. Another important choice you have to make is the scale of your map. The scale is going to determine how big of an area of the Earth your map is covering and how much detail you're able to show. Because the more area you want to show in your map, the less detail, generally, you're going to be able to put on there. So here's another map of the city of Pittsburgh. This one shows average household income. And so when we're looking at this map, we can see things like the uh, Shady Side neighborhood of Pittsburgh is one of the richest areas. The Hill District or Homewood are neighborhoods that are on average very poor. And if we wanted to explain the pattern that we see, if we want to say why there, then we would look at things like housing discrimination within the city, um, the history of 
urban redevelopment programs, the location of industry, and those kinds of factors. We could also map average household income at the scale of the entire state of Pennsylvania. We could zoom out, and then we see a lot more area, but with a lot less detail. Everything that we saw on that Pittsburgh map is now within Allegheny County, one little blob on this current map. So we lose that fine detail. We can't look at those things like housing discrimination within the city. But now we can see other patterns. When we look at this broader scale map, we can see that the suburban areas around Philadelphia are clearly the richest in the state. We have another kind of pocket of higher incomes in the area around Pittsburgh, and then much lower incomes through the center of the state. And then if we want to explain why there, want to explain why certain areas of the state are richer or poorer, we would look at a different set of phenomena. We'd look at things like the economic base of different areas. So the central part of the state where people are lower income is a mostly rural area. It's an area that's been dependent on logging for its main industry for a long time. And so we'd be looking at those kind of factors to explain what's going on at this broader scale. Scale can be technically defined as the ratio between a distance between two places on the map and the distance between those two places on the actual Earth. And so we can represent scale as a fraction. And when we do this, it's usually written with a colon between the two numbers. So we can have a map that's at a scale of 1 to 100,000, which means that one inch on the map represents 100,000 inches on the Earth, or one centimeter on the map represents 100,000 centimeters on the actual Earth. We could have another map that's at a scale of 1 to 1 million. So one inch on the map covers 1 million inches worth of territory on the real Earth. When we look at these representative fractions, if we think of them as fractions, then we can understand why for a cartographer, for a map maker, a map that is really zoomed in, a map that shows a small area, would be referred to as a large scale map, and a map that shows a lot of area that's very zoomed out would be referred to as a small scale map. Because if you look at those fractions, 1 to 100,000 is a larger fraction, it's a larger number than 1 1 millionth. Now that's kind of confusing. We want to say that a map that shows a small area, we want to call that in sort of common sense, a small scale map. So for this class, I'll tend to not use the terms large scale and small scale. I'll tend to refer either to the actual area being covered. So we might talk about a city scale map or a state scale map or a world scale map. Or we can talk about things being zoomed in or zoomed out. So zoomed in to show a little bit of area in high detail or zoomed out to show a lot of area in a lot less detail. Another common way to represent scale is with a graphical scale, a little line on the map that's marked off with hash marks to show the amount of distance. And this is a really great way to represent a scale because if you blow up or shrink down the map, so for example, if you took this video and maximized it to fill your whole screen or minimized it to just a little video, if there was a map on there with a graphical scale, that scale would change size along with the map. Whereas if you had a representative fraction, when the size of the map changes, the representative fraction changes. An inch on the map is no longer the same as it was if you blow up or shrink down that map. But if you have a graphical scale, it blows up or shrinks down along with the map. Another important choice that we need to make in map making, especially for small scale maps, that is maps that show continents or the entire world, is projection. Projection refers to how we take the round earth and put it on a flat piece of paper. And there's no one right way to do that. There are a whole variety of projections that have been developed, a whole variety of ways to take that round earth and flatten it out into a map. And in a future lesson, we'll be looking at the advantages and disadvantages of each of these projections. Why would you choose one projection over another? So just to give you a preview of how different these projections can be, and therefore why it matters so much that we choose the right one for the purpose of our map. Here's one called the Mercator projection. Compare that to this one, the Molowide projection. Or this one, the Goods Interrupted Homolocene. 
Each of those projections has its advantages and disadvantages. We need to choose the right one for the map that we're making. Then the last important choice we need to make is symbology. Symbology refers to how we represent our information on the map. Whatever it is we're trying to show on the map, we're going to use some sort of symbols to indicate where it is. So in this case, here's a map of the UV index forecast, how much ultraviolet radiation you would get hit with if you went outside on the particular day that this map was generated for. And so in this case, the symbology they've chosen to represent the different levels of UV radiation with different colors. And in this case, I like this map because it's an example of a bad choice of symbology. Because if you look at the legend, the legend is the little code that says what the symbols mean. You can see the legend at the bottom, that each color represents a different UV index. And you can see that the lowest UV index is shown in blue, and the highest UV index is shown in a slightly different blue, with the middle levels shown in orange and red. And so this is confusing both because the endpoints are so similar and because psychologically we tend to associate red with the idea of burning and energy, which has a natural association with lots of ultraviolet radiation. And so our first instinct when looking at this map is going to be incorrect. We're going to have to scrutinize that legend. It's a good idea to always look carefully at the legend of a map to understand what the symbols are actually representing because many maps like this are misleading. But if you're the one making the map, it's a good idea to think about using the right symbology to convey the right idea to the people that are looking at your map.